at the beginning, Paul, and uh, you know, talk a little bit about uh, where you were born and your family uh, situation as you were growing up. Okay, my story brings it begins in Brockton, Massachusetts, on January 4th, 1938. Uh, my parents are blue collar workers, as they are called. My dad was an electrical lineman for 40 years, and my mom was an at home mom. And I grew up during World War II, and still remember some of those issues about rationing of food, and planes flying over, and blackouts at night, and so forth. Um, typical growing up attended local schools, um, played sports, didn't have Little League in those days, but I did play high school baseball and a little bit of basketball for the church league. And then the Navy. Yep. So that was obviously after high school. After high school. Yeah. Oh, right after high school? Or well, actually, actually, as a junior in high school, I joined the Naval Reserve. It was very fashionable in those days because there was a draft, and a lot of my friends said, hey, let's join the Naval Reserve. And I did. And here I am, 17 years old, and the next thing I know, I'm going on a summer cruise on a USS Rushampkin, an APD-89. I haven't even been to boot camp yet. So the benefit of people watching, what, is, what kind of a ship is that? That was high-speed transport, and it's an old World War II transport, but a small ship. Um, goodness, probably only about 300 feet long, but they did carry Marines in those days. And we went up to Halifax, Nova Scotia. <laughs> 17 years old. 17 years old. Yeah. And um, came back and finished the summer and back into school for my senior year. Uh, I decided, that because in those days there weren't any scholarships for college. My dad said, hey Paul, I can't really afford college. So you knew you had a draft commitment. I was already in the reserves. I said, I'm going to enlist regular Navy. So I went down and enlisted in the regular Navy. But before I did that, the reserves still owned me, and they put me on another two-week cruise to just around on the USS Columbus. Okay. So come back, August 21st, 1956. They sent me off to boot camp in Bainbridge, Maryland. And this is where the story begins. <laughs> Ryan, I told it to him, he doesn't believe it. But you're looking at a 26-year-old, a 26-year Navy veteran who cannot swim. Really? And the reason I can't swim is because uh, I really get kicked out of boot camp <laughs> before the swimming test. And what, what that was all about, my company commander swore up and down that I was still in the reserve program, that I'd already gone two weeks of boot camp. And I said, no, I haven't. It's, so I'm not going to argue with them. So they had six weeks of boot camp, and I went up to the admin office as instructed, and they agreed with the boot camp commander that I was going to go to radio school. I said, what about my company, my reserve company, graduation? You've already been here. <laughs> I haven't been here. So. It cut me short on the boot camp. I didn't get to take the swimming test. And, excuse <clears throat> me, went on two weeks leave, came back to attend radio school. And so at no, at no other point they had you jump in the water and, uh, no? No. <laughs> don't, tell, don't tell some of my friends that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I didn't really. End it. So anyway, my radio school was a six-month school in Bainbridge, Maryland. And basically the school was Morse code, learning how to copy Morse code. So, Bainbridge was, uh, Bainbridge, was, that, was that a Navy base? Or At Navy that time, base? it was boot camp. Uh, it's north of Baltimore. Okay. Um, probably about 40 miles north of Baltimore. Right. It's gone now. It's uh, completely vacant. So, how long was the radio school? Six months. And, uh, and upon graduating from that school, I got orders to my ship, first ship, the USS Hale, a destroyer, out of Newport, Rhode Island. So Morse code, I mean, was literally the way they that's, still communicated? That's, that's the way we communicated. Everything was in Morse code. I still remember that to this day. It's like a second language. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How long did that last? I mean, when did Morse code kind of go by the boards? Uh, I would say in the early 70s. Okay. A lot of the merchant ships still use Morse code, but uh, Navy ships were going into teletype and satellites. Interesting. So, yeah. So anyway, I'm sorry, so you were, uh, it was the USS Hale was your first assignment? 
Earth and assignment. Yep. And that ship was what we call a steamer. We would leave Newport and we would go everywhere. My first cruise in 1957 was a brief stop in Annapolis, Maryland. This is in July, I think, of the year, 1957, we picked up midshipmen. And then we attended the largest international Navy review in Norfolk, Virginia, and then on to Rio de Janeiro. And we crossed the equator. So I'm not sure if you know what crossing the equator is, but in those days, it was a big initiation. Yeah. You would call it hazing today. So we survived that and went into Rio de Janeiro. So is that classified, what the hazing consisted of, or is that something you can talk about? Or? Well, we had what they call the royal baby, the royal dentist, the royal barber, and um, I, I do have a picture we can show you later, but uh, it was quite an event. It's, yeah. and they said today they don't do it. Right. It's, you crawl on your hands the whole length of the ship, and they actually soak what they call a shillelagh in salt water for a week and then let it get real stiff, and they sort of Paddle make, a, make a sailor out of you. Yep. Okay. <laughs> That's great. So, um, so you went but, down to, oh, go ahead. But I, I, <clears throat> I do want to just, yes, correct. We went to South America, but I do want to talk that briefly that uh, John McCain, a few years back, wrote a book, Faith of My Fathers. And my son gave me a copy of that. And I was reading the book, and lo and behold, John McCain went on that same cruise on a sister ship. And he complained about being on that destroyer for six weeks, crossing the equator and so forth. But mainly because of the fact that destroyers couldn't make their own fresh water. We would leave port and we couldn't have a shower for a week. Wow. And Saturday night, normally at 1900, 7 o'clock local, they'd open the shower for one hour. And four showers with 250 guys trying to take a shower. <laughs> wow. So when you were uh, first there as a radio man, were you um, working a shift, you know? We worked, we were very short of radio men. We worked what we called port and starboard, eight on, eight off, eight on, eight off. And 19 years old, you start to feel that too. And one incident on the hail, <clears throat> actually again, we're gonna fast forward to 1958, which was a very busy year. We were operating in the Gulf of Mexico with the USS Antietam. I had the mid-watch, and because we only had five radio, and I was on this watch by myself, and copying the Morse code, we had what we call a broadcast. It'd come on at the hour, and be Morse code, copying messages. If you to your ship, you'd copy it, tell it, I mean a typewriter. If not, you just type, no concern in your log. Well, here it is, probably about 10 minutes after one, and it gets this immediate message. I look up uh, call signs because we had you know, international call signs that we had listed. That, that's not to our ship. No concern. About two minutes later, I looked at it again and I went to a panic. There's an immediate message addressed to my ship, the hail. <laughs> they run this CW, Morse code broadcast, until 10 minutes of the hour. So that's when they would break for 10 minutes. At 10 minutes of the hour, I rushed up to the signal bridge and I said to the duty signalman, it was on, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning, can you get a copy of this message from that carrier over there? He said, I'll try. Well, he did. Brought it down to me and it was all encrypted. So now we have to wake up the duty crypto officer. Turned out that Vice President Nixon was visiting Venezuela in 1958. And anti-American students didn't like Nixon or Americans. And there's his, his vehicle in, I think, Caracas, but they were attacking the vehicle. Eisenhower were ordering naval forces, like our ship, the Antietam, to move closer to Venezuela in case we needed to help in that situation. Fortunately, uh, the vice president was able to be rescued and out of there. So the ship had to change course to Correct, but if I, I, I missed the message the first time around, I, I would have went. <laughs> so that's yeah. one of my stories. And, and so the message was going for 50 straight minutes? What? Yeah, you just sat there with earphones, cop and coat. Wow. 
That's that's uh, and that's for six that hours, and seven hours. Concentration. That's why I'm deaf today. Yeah. <laughs> well, and with, and, ta and talk about that. So was the radio signals? I mean, were they pretty loud, ear splitting? Or it depends on where you were. Um, primarily, we copied what we got to call a broadcast out of uh, Washington D.C. But we had transmitter sites around the world, and uh, sometimes you could like. Other times, you, like push the phones on top of your temples. So depending on how far you were you know, out in the ocean. Right. And so that's a pretty common um, condition for, for people who served as radio men was uh, hearing loss? It is. Wow. Yeah. So that's <clears throat> one of the stories in 58. Yeah. I got two more. Sure. Keep going. <laughs> it was a very busy year. And, uh, now we fast forward to, I think, you know, July, August, August of 58. There are problems in the Mediterranean, namely Beirut. Um, Beirut uh, had a Christian president, and there was a civil war going on. Believe it or not, the Muslims didn't like the Christians and so forth. So President Eisenhower took the side of the Christian president, ordered 14,000 Marines to enter Beirut, namely the airport section. They, of course, they needed naval support offshore. We deployed to that area. And uh, we just showed the flag, if you will, for a few weeks. Now, the Chinese are acting up over in Formosa. They're firing in Matsu Komori. Which, so the Navy said, we need another aircraft carrier over there. So they took the USS Essex from the Mediterranean through the Suez Canal, transited the Indian Ocean. But she needed escorts. My ship, the Hale and the Forrest Sherman, were picked to go. So here we go, high-speed transport. Yeah. So how, that's a pretty you know, big transit. So how long was your deployment for all that? I mean, to be in one part of the world over to the other? It took us probably about, I would say, probably about seven days to reach, go through the Suez Canal, and then steam to uh, to the um, Formosa Straits. So, but I mean, so deployments back then, total deployments, what were Just they? six, nine months. Six, yeah. They're typical. Yeah. So at that point, were you still single? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where and where was sort of home headquarters for you? Newport, Rhode Island. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> we made that transit with the Essex, and uh, now they released us, but they decided to send us to Japan for liberty. And we spent three days in Japan, and they sent a message saying, okay, continue transit home across the Pacific. So that turned into a world cruise yeah. in 1958. So what was Japan like in 1958? <laughs> Wild, but really? very friendly, very, yeah. very friendly. Uh, and little did I realized I'd be back there in 10 years. But <clears throat> it, was, it was a wild and crazy time. So it was Tokyo that you were saying? I didn't get up to Tokyo at that yeah. time. Uh, we just stayed in Yakuska. We were only there three days. <coughs> Excuse me, but uh, being the radium and short of radium, and you had maybe one day liberty and then two days duty. Right. So you had to kind of correct pack your uh, R and R correct <laughs> short time period there. Um, okay. So then you headed back to Newport. We right came out. back across Pacific. We stopped in Honolulu. Uh, left Honolulu. We were supposed to go to San Francisco. And lo and behold, uh, an Air Force uh, jet was lost at sea. Uh, they were in our vicinity, so they dispatched my ship to go search and rescue. Uh, and we did find the body of that pilot and called in a helicopter and they met him back and took him away to uh, back to Pearl Harbor. So that delayed our visit to San Francisco, so we went to San Diego. So, and once you got back to Rhode Island, and, I mean, it looks like you were on the East Coast for a number of years after Correct. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. and why don't you tell us about that? <clears throat> well, we went back to uh, you know Newport, but that didn't last long. We went then to a North Atlantic cruise, and <clears throat> we hit some very rough seas because now it's the winter in the North Atlantic, and we we're taking on seas 35, 40 feet, and knocked our sonar dome off the bottom of our ship. So we had to go into Portsmouth, England for two weeks, Her Majesty's Dockyard, Portsmouth. So that was okay because we got up to London and saw some good things and, and of course HMS Victory was there in uh, Portsmouth so we were able to tour that and, and Lord Nelson and things like that. Great. 
And by then, um, I mean, England was kind of recovering from the war and oh, doing, doing right. a lot better right, in right. mm -hmm. society there. So, um, and then, and then it looks like again you were in, in Brockton, Weymouth, Bainbridge, and Weymouth, Mass again during the what, early sixties. What happened is, uh, well, I met the woman of my life when I was still in the Navy in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, she happened to live in Fall River, Massachusetts. And anyway, we started to get serious. So she told me, we're serious, but I'm not going to marry you if you stay in the Navy. I said, okay. So I got out of the Navy. Matter of fact, today's date is what, August 17th? Uh, Saturday was August 15th. 55 years ago, this past Saturday, I left the Navy for the first time. And there I am. Wow. However, I'm without a job. And I'm looking, and you think jobs are hard to find today? Remember, I'm just a radio man here. I don't have any college behind me or anything like that. So one day in my home in Brockton, I received an envelope, and the return address was U.S. government, post office box, da da da. Trust to me, so I open it up. There's a memorandum, a little government memorandum, badly typed. I mean, it misspelled words, cross over, them, and so forth. But there was an application, and the, and the little memo said, if you're interested in a government job, fill out the enclosed application. Well, that must have been about that thick. They asked me more questions about my experience in the Navy my knowledge of topology of overseas areas, do I speak any foreign languages? And this concerned me because I did have a top secret clearance while I was on active duty. So I took it to a local reserve center, which was a naval security group. And I talked to the commander and I said, Commander, I got this in the mail. And I said, there's something going on here. They want to know everything that maybe... He said, let me see that. He says, I'll get back to you in a week. In about a week's time, he called me on the phone. Fill it out. It's good. And send it back. About three weeks later, and I remember this very clearly, this is in October of the year, I was asked to come for an interview about 5.30 in the evening at a man's private residence in Brockton, Massachusetts. It was a stormy night. The rain was sweeping, windswept rain. Leaves were falling off the trees. There's the house. But ring the doorbell, be greeted by a barking dog. And then the door opens, and there's a Doberman pincher, and I can still see him snarling at me. And behind him is a bald headed man with a scar on his face. And I said, What am I getting into? So he backs the dog off, invites me in, we go into his living room. And he sits down and he gives me a piece of paper to read. And he says, I want you to sign that. Do you understand what you're about to sign? I said, yes, sir. Secrecy oath. Gentleman was a CIA agent, recruiter. So I said, what do you want with me? He said, oh, I want to talk to you. So he ran through a series of questions with me. And um, pretty in-depth questions. You know, particularly about my Morse code abilities and so forth. And um, <clears throat> so I was really, you know, being 22 years old, I'm, wow, you know. So I said, look, I'm engaged now. Let me talk to my wife-to-be about this. He says, you bring her back here. I did, so I told my wife. I couldn't tell her too much. Just told her that this gentleman wanted to talk to her. So again, I'm not working, so she's thinking, hey, government job. <clears throat> so we go back and he sits her down, has her go through the same sign a paper and all that good stuff, and so she don't really understand. So he starts questioning her, and she starts questioning him. Well, if if my husband to be is hired, where will he be? Where will he go? He'll have no choice of where we send him. But we're about ready to send him to Langley for the final inter interview. She didn't know where Langley was, but anyway, but she heard no choice. And then the kicker was quote, unquote, and he's ever found out, we will not say we know him. And Dottie says to me, 
oh, this isn't the job for you. <laughs> I said, you're right. Hmm. So that's when I went back in the Navy. That and and that, was that a difficult process to get back in? No. <clears throat> it's actually, Naval Air Station South Weymouth were looking for radio. And actually, it was a reserve air station. But they were looking for people to serve on active duty. And so when I went there and interviewed with the chief, <clears throat> he said, you're the only one that been over here. So he says, this is the deal. You come back on active duty as a reservist. And you'll stay here as long as you want. I said, what do you mean, as long as I want? He says, yeah, we're reservists. TARS, Training and Administration of Reservists. I said, wow, this sounds like a deal. So I'm an E5, second class. So I signed up. I mean, E6, went to B school, Radium B school. That was nine months. And then, lo and behold, Vietnam got going hot and heavy. And uh, don't worry, I said regular Navy again. <clears throat> so, yeah, so, I mean, I know you had a distinguished career in Vietnam, and, and um, the, um, I think a lot of times people don't sort of think about the U.S. Navy as part of the, that conflict, um, but obviously they needed you over there. Maybe. Why don't you tell us about that? Well, let me just back up, uh, yep. Mr. Congressman, on, on how I got to go to Vietnam. <clears throat> I'm up for orders, I'm regular Navy now. My personnel officer, and I remember this man well, Commander W.I. Brown, he called me up at radio and he said, I was a chief then, Chief, I received your orders. And I said, where am I going? He says, you're not. And he says, I'm not. He says, no, they're to Newport, Rhode Island. I says, Commander, I said, I live in New England, it's my home. And I go and it's the USS Salomone, it's a fleet oiler. That was not the orders for you. So he says, I told him to cancel. I said, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> Two weeks later, he calls me again. Got orders. Where am I going? You're not. USS Pocketuck, home port in Mayport, Florida. Oil it. You're not going. Come here, what are you doing to me? Two weeks later, message orders report within 30 days. Commander, 7th Fleet Staff, Embark, USS Providence, home port in Yokosuka, Japan. These are your orders. This, these are the orders that are going to make you something. And he's right. So I reported to the USS Providence, but the 7th Fleet flag. And that was based, <coughs> on, that was based out of Japan? Yeah. Yep. 1968. I walked aboard that ship. It came from an air station. It five, six radiomen. We averaged six, 60 messages a day on, at best, 60. Walked aboard, the lieutenant said, welcome aboard, chief. You're my message center chief. Okay? How many messages do we get a day? It's about 3,000. 3,000 messages a day. The, the seventh fleet was running the war. Right. And, you know, the Navy war. I said, and he says, you're my new message center chief. <laughs> and I've just made chief. I'm only eight years in the Navy. So the first few months was pretty strenuous. Right. But I got to tell you that uh, for some reason there are people in my life that have seen the best in me, and um, I made it through that first year. And in, in terms of you know those duties, were you pretty much close to Japan, or were you out and deployed? Deployed. Yeah. First cruise get underway January fifth, nineteen sixty eight. Head to Vietnam. It took us three days to get to Vietnam from Yokosuka. <clears throat> we now get our mission on the naval gunfire support line. I happened to be in radio on J January 23rd, and I walked by this teletype machine. Actually, was, we copied press because we put out a ship's newspaper, and it was AP. It was ringing. Bing, 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 bing. Or, U.S. Navy ship under attack, Sea of Japan. Ripped it off, and it says USS Pueblo. So I ran it up to the command center, the war room. I says to the commander, I said, do we have anything on this thing? And of course they did, because we had what we call back channels with the security group. So that was my first thing with the Pueblo. So they pulled us off the gun line and we steamed up to uh, the Sea of Japan. And uh, pretty trying moments. Pretty trying uh, <clears throat> what to do, because here we are, the Three Star. He's running that show from a naval point of view. They have our ship, the USS Pueblo. The message is going back and forth between us and Washington, namely the JCS. And our plan was to go in and get the damn ship, excuse me. 
<laughs> going to get the ship. And they got shot down. We're going to go seamen in there with air cover and so forth. But uh, that's, that's the first thing, the Pueblo. And they sailed that ship knowing its mission, with what we call a full crypto allowance. You don't go into hazardous waters with a whole crypto allowance. And they did, so that compromised the whole Navy wow. at that time. But fortunately, we got most of the crew because they lost one, but most of the crew got back. And unfortunately, the Pueblo was still held by the North Koreans. Hmm. Still in active service with the Navy. Is that right? They never it is. It's still the Constitution and the Pueblo, the oldest ships held up. Still on active duty with it. That's a, that's a really interesting fact. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. So after the you recovered this, the the crew you had back. Well, no, this is before that. The crew got released about a year later. Okay. Uh, our mission terminated probably about two weeks later because Tet in Vietnam was really starting to really get going. So we steamed back to Vietnam and we wound up off the coast of uh, <clears throat> South Vietnam, but namely Way, as I mentioned a little while ago, and. Uh, we had a six-inch gun mount forward, and this is the USS Providence now, and we blasted the Citadel, blasted that Citadel, and the Marines, 26 Marines were able to get back in and get that job done for us and them. And we got a Navy unit accommodation for doing that. So, um, again, because as I said, mentioned earlier, I think a lot of people don't visualize the, sort of the Navy's Role and all this. So, can you describe that a little bit? Like, were you positioned just offshore? Was it were you by yourself? Were you with other uh, no, we, surface ships? We were with ourselves. We normally operated by ourselves. Uh, wow. Did you have any protection true. with you in terms of smaller craft or anything? No. Yeah. And, did, and did the Vietnamese? Did they have any you know ability to try and? They did. Uh, before I got on board the Providence, as we got so close to their shore that <clears throat> their artillery fire did strike our ship, namely hit the radar mast and tumble that off the ship. Unfortunately, that was before I reported on board, but we'd get pretty close. And, yeah. And, and, they, fact, and they would take some shots at it if, if they we could. Do, yeah. We would do another operation called Sea Dragon, and Sea Dragon was, we'd make these runs at night, and this time it was two ships. One ship would go in a high-speed run towards the shoreline and then veer off in hope that they would draw the enemy's artillery fire out. And by doing so, the second ship would be able to spot that. <laughs> So those are pretty like, <laughs> right? And um, so when you were in sort of, uh, you know, that hot combat or whatever, um, I mean, as a radio man, what what was your? I mean, were, were you doing more? Were you, were you on longer ships? We had special circuits. We had uh, voice circuits with the air controllers ashore, the uh, gunfire supporters, and so forth. So we'd be monitoring those circuits, make sure they're operating okay. And and would. I mean, people's the voice, voice circuits. time, you know, changed in terms of how long you were on duty just because you were... No, we just did the regular watch, yeah, yes. Yeah. Right, because right. I guess you're no good after a while if you just right. keep working right. straight through, so... Right. Um, and, and how long was the way, you know, Tet Offensive? Was it, you know, weeks long or uh, months long? Uh, or? It's probably about a month long. It was yeah. in a little off Vietnam East. The army invaded the South. Right. And Way was just one of those battles, as you know. I mean, it was just all the way down the country. Right. So it was a long, drawn out thing, but we drove them back. Yeah. And as I mentioned, uh, really, a, I mean, we didn't. Was, we never lost a battle in Vietnam, but we lost the war. Right. So after you know you were you know done there, I mean, did they have you come go back to Japan or I mean, would you? No, we go back. Uh, the yeah. flagship uh, actually showed a flag type of ship because uh, sometimes they pull us out of Vietnam, but we go show the flag, a political thing, maybe Singapore, right. Manila, uh, you know, some good ports. So, yeah. and, and did you get a chance to take a break when you tied Correct. We did give us to give the liberty and go take pictures and tours and so forth. Right. And I saw quite a bit over there. I think Singapore to Korea, to Taiwan, and so forth. So, um, in terms of your total time in the Vietnam sort of conflict, it was it about a year or two? Or I spent three years there. Three years. We, wow. I spent a year on the Providence and. <coughs> <coughs> See what they're doing, they were rotating flagships for the uh, Seventh Fleet, and usually the Providence, Oklahoma City. Well, the Providence tenure was coming 
to an end in November of 68. The Oklahoma City was being deployed from San Diego, but the Oklahoma City had a new message center, brand new, first one afloat, computerized message processing distribution. I have a year's experience, so they sent me back from the Providence to San Diego to ride the Oklahoma City over. And was that pretty unusual for someone in the Navy to be there that many years? Oh. Not really. There's a two-year tour typically for those, yeah. those ships. They were forward deployed, home ported in Yakuska. So, for example, families, my family was there right. in Yokohama. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I remember they took me off the ship in Da Nang, peeled me out of Da Nang, and they sent me out to Yankee Station where the carriers were, and I catapulted off the USS Coral Sea yeah. into uh, Kiwi Point in the Philippines and caught the plane back to uh, to uh, San Diego. And, and so what year was that? That, that was 1968, okay. November. Right. And um, <clears throat> so um, so the Oklahoma City... Relieved the Providence right. as the uh, flagship. Yeah. And, and what kind of action did they see or what activity did they see? We had quite a bit of activity too. Uh, again, it's a naval gunfire support ship. Uh, however, the difference between the Providence and Oklahoma City is their missiles. The Oklahoma City carried tailors, and there's a little bit bigger missile, a longer range. Matter of fact, that's one of our missions, always go up north to try to draw the MiGs, MiGs out of, uh, out of uh, Hanoi, Haiphong. And while we're up there one time, our sister ship, the USS Long Beach, and they kept that secret for a long time, but she had tailors too. And she bagged a MiG just as she was getting airborne. And that was like 26 miles in. Wow. You know, back. <laughs> But one thing about the Oklahoma City, uh, one story that I want to call to mind, or bring to mind rather. April 15, 1969. You know what happened that day? North Korea again. They shot down one of our reconnaissance aircraft, an EC-121, out of Naval Air Station at Tsugi, Japan. 31 souls lost their life that day. We're on the gun line again. Another formation back to the Sea of Japan. Pilot's name was Lieutenant Commander James Overstreet. Oops, I'll be right in a minute. That's okay, Dave. We got some water in there. His wife was my son's school teacher. And he never recovered these men. But she announced to the parents, and I wasn't there to hear that, my wife can tell you. These are my children. My family, my husband's gone. My children, I'm staying with him until the end of the, end of the school year. And she did, a remarkable woman. Huh. So, that's my story with the EC-121 shoot down. Another one we never did anything about either. Huh. So and it goes on with North Korea. Yeah, no, and, and there's still stuff happening in the last few weeks. Right. It's, um, the, um, so the Oklahoma City, um, I mean, you said they were, you guys were there sometimes drawing MIGs to fly, did they get, never get close to you? Or, uh, they, they, we had MIG alerts all day long. I never saw one, but I hear that on the speaker system all day. MIG alert, MIG alert. And uh, because we'd go up and try to draw them out, and again, we're operating by ourselves, though. So. <laughs> um, I left the ship in 1972, and that final battle, if you will, in Haiphong, the Oklahoma City shot down a mate. They did that one with the tailors. So then, again, just so uh, I'm clear and the, and the record's clear, so your total time in Vietnam was like 68 to se after 70 or 70? Correct. That's a, we, <clears throat> they paid us what they call combat pay, Right. and I drew combat pay for 36 months. Even though it wasn't, you know, like 30 days, we'd only sometimes be there for two days, but within the combat zone, as they called it. Now, one issue, uh, you know, just fast forwarding to the present for a moment, because I know you've been a pretty strong advocate uh, for Navy veterans who uh, were in that era. In Agent the, Orange. Is the Agent Orange issue and the Blue Water <clears throat> restriction that's there. And um, so even though you were in the middle of a lot of this combat there in Hawaii and then up in the north there, when mm -hmm. you described that, um, Again, the, the rules under the VA in order to get Agent Orange um, 
benefits is that you actually had to step foot on, on the, the land of, of Vietnam. So right. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Well, that's true. The VA really is the, you know, you have to touch, touch boots on the ground, as they call it. Um, and I find that kind of like strange. For example, I was talking to Ryan McKenna before you came in. Um, the Oklahoma City was deployed to Vietnam in 1964. Again, it was just a short two years for them. But they did go up the Saigon River. And because they went up the Saigon River and, and had some liberty in Saigon, the crew members who have presumptive diseases are recognized by VA for having that disease. My question is, what Agent Orange was in Saigon? Meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, those that served in Da Nang Harbor month after month, and we desalinated the water, the whole thing, and, and uh, Da Nang was loaded with Agent Orange, they denied any benefits for any recognition, I should say. Another story about one of my shipmates, uh, you know, I attend Navy reunions. You know, I was in Buffalo, New York, probably about eight years ago, and had a reception before the reunion really started. So this man came up to me and he tapped me on the shoulder. You're Chief Teller, aren't you? And I said, I am. And he says, you probably don't remember me, but I'm Wayne Fleischman. I said, says, of course, Wayne. I used to work for me in, on, the, on the Oklahoma City. He says, yeah. And he says, I came over here purposely. I only live in Binghamton, New York. But I came here, I knew you were going to be here because you were my chief in Vietnam. And I said, well, gee, that's really nice of you to remember me. And he said, I also want to tell you that I have stage four prostate cancer. And I said, any recognition from the VA? No. Nope. Three months later, he passed. Mm -hmm. and so it was like that. And I have many shipmates that are sick, ill. Well, yeah. again, if nothing else, this um, taping, you know, will help sort of educate a lot of people yeah. about the fact that there's this kind and, of strange restriction. And, and the other irony is the fact that I did have boots on the ground, albeit only eight hours. Cameron Bay, Vietnam, in 1968, August. Why did I go ashore there? Again, being a communicator, we're bringing a new US, USS New Jersey over. They upgraded their gun last week. Did nothing to improve our communications. So we went ashore to discuss how we're going to communicate with the New Jersey so that she wouldn't miss any of her gunfire support mission. But my eight hours qualified me for boots on the ground. Eight hours. Meanwhile, 36 months in the harbor doesn't. Amazing. So, so, I mean, at some point then your time in Vietnam came to an end and, and then you headed back uh, to the East Coast? I got orders to Naval Communications Station, Newport, Rhode Island. And what kind of work did that involve? Again, communications. Uh, I ran a message center. Uh, we took at those time at that time. Newport was busy with destroyers. And I had a fact commander the cruiser to port, uh, cruiser destroyer land was there. Must have been 50, 60 ships homeported there. But that downsizing, they started to pull all those ships out of there. And it was my job to consolidate all the communication efforts. So we did that successfully. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's almost hard to remember that Newport was a Navy base. At, and know, everybody, that everybody said, God, the Navy's pulling out of Newport. What's it going to be like? Yeah. Well, anybody that's been in Newport lately? Right. The, uh, so um, then in the 70s, it looks like you started doing some international travel again. Well, let me go back to Newport. Yeah. Here I am, three years in Vietnam, going overseas. And I've got three rows of ribbons. And I looked at my fellow chiefs. They got national defense good conduct. Chiefs. I said, what's with you guys? What do you mean? Don't you guys go to sea? No. You don't go to sea duty? No. What do you do? We go to type three. What's type three? Those are remote communication stations around the world. Isolated. No. So serving two and a half years in Newport, come time for orders. I think I'm going to try this Type 3 stuff. Call up the detailer. He says, I got Scotland. I said, where about in Scotland? Boy, that sounds good. He says, Thurzo, Scotland. And I says, let me talk to my wife. So she said, let's go. 
Thurso happens to be in the very north of Scotland. Actually, they call it north of Scotland, the Highlands, right on the Pentland Firth. And we had a little radio station there. And no, it's not. This is Radio Scotland. There was a radio station where we supported submarine communications. And there was 52 of us stationed there. Two officers, five chiefs, and the rest enlisted. So it's a good tour. Yeah. So it's like a small village? Small village. Yeah. Yeah. Small village. So, because we're sort of overloaded with senior NCOs, as they say in the military, Army and the Marines, uh, I told the commanding officer, a commander, I said, look, I'm going to take over military welfare and rec for the guys, because these guys are drinking too much and all that. We had a club. <laughs> he said, good idea, Master Chief. I was a Master Chief by this time. <clears throat> One day I got a call from this English man, and he says, would you be interested in bringing the lads out for a poll on Saturday morning? I was not really asking any questions what a poll was, but anything to get the guys out of the barracks. I asked for directions for where this poll was going to be. So he gave it to me and uh, got a bunch of guys rounded up, got the little mini bus from the station, and drove out there to this little location. And there's nothing out there but a field, but uh -huh, there's a pub. They must know something in this pub. So go in there and bar man says, yep, there'll be some people in the field in about an hour's time. You're late early. Would you like a pint? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so this story goes on and on. But anyway, the time we got out of the pub, went over to the field. There's a whole bunch of people there now. And I find out the pole is a tug of war. And I said, you guys go off the bus and take care of that, that pole. Meanwhile, I'm going to stay on the bus because I got a pint. One of my men yells through the door, Master Chief, some old lady out here wants to meet you. So I get up and I look, and there's a woman standing there, very proper, and next to her is a gentleman with a kilt, he's got medals on his chest, and I say, oh my God, that's it. So I come off the bus, do my best, walk over, and the gentleman in the kilt says, Sir, I'd like to introduce to you Her Majesty, the Queen Mother. Wow. <laughs> so, well, so. so she come out to watch the uh, tug of war? Is that she yeah. had? She would come up. She would come up to Thurzo every July for a fortnight. She had a castle there, Castle of May, and that's her vacation every July. And the following year, she invited us back, and we brought the dependents. We brought the whole base. And the first thing she said, because I was there when I got off the bus, she says, thank you for coming back. That's very nice. What a great <laughs> story. I got a picture over here. Is that right? Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. So um, in terms of the, you know, it was submarines that you were doing most of your uh, communications work with. Mm -hmm. And so obviously this is uh, Cold War. Cold War. Uh, and I mean, that's obviously <coughs> the North Atlantic uh, was a pretty hot place. Right, the spec yeah. ops they were doing and so forth. Yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, obviously, a lot of that kind of work was uh, classified, and mm -hmm. some of it may still be to this day. But um, I mean, did it involve, do you think, tracking Russian subs and, um, you know, just doing right. exercises? Or I mean, how can you describe what kind of um, activity was going on? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> not, not, not really. <laughs> because, you know, we just did the. the you know, communication for right. our government, a backup system. Right. So, it, um, you, you know what Circuit Mayflower was? I don't. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. So, the, um, but was there a, a U.S. Navy base there, or did they share? Uh, <clears throat> it was a little radio, naval radio station, Thurzo Scotland. Right. And it was actually uh, seven miles uh, west of the town of Thurzo. Right. But we did have military housing in the town. Okay. And we lived on John Kennedy Drive. Wow, is that wonderful? Yeah. It was wonderful until All right. one night, Thanksgiving night, this one of our sailors killed his wife. Wow. On John Kennedy Drive and the anniversary of John Kennedy's right. assassination. Yeah. yeah. So, but was there was there U.S. Um, sh uh, ships and subs tied up in England? No, that no, all? nothing, no. Okay. We were just. Remote transmitter size. Okay. Yeah. I tried. Okay, so then it looks like you moved on back towards uh, North America. You went to Iceland. Iceland. So, yeah. 
Naval Communication Station, Iceland. And again, that was another one of these assignments? Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. and did you have children with you at that yes, point? Yes, correct. Yeah, my, my probably should have said my youngest son was born in Yokosuka, Japan. Yeah. So anyway, yes, they came, they attended uh, the schools and so forth. Now, in fact, in Scotland, they went to Scottish schools. Yeah. Uh, what a great experience. Yeah. <clears throat> and so Iceland, um, again, same kind of kind of work as in Scotland? Yeah, I was Master Chief of the Command, and we had 350 uh, communicators, if you will. And we had the main center, which was a communication center, which provided message uh, processing for all the commands there, including Air Force commands. And then we had a remote transmitter site and a remote receiver site. And well, mainly uh, the Russians would come down at uh, Greenland, Iceland, UK Gap. Excuse me, and we had uh, F-4 air aircraft that go up and intercept them or guide them through. Right. But um, it was kind of quiet. And, and how was that interacting with sort of the native uh, population there? Were they Icelanders were very, uh, for example, when we first got there, we lived off base. We didn't have enough housing. So for one year, we lived in the town of Keflavik. And they had, Icelanders had strict rules on what we could take off base. My wife would go shopping in the commissary, and she was, we were only allowed, like food stamps, only allowed so much to take off every month. And she would have to go through an Icelandic checkpoint. And it depends on how they felt. Sometimes they'd make her offload the car and pick everything out, put it on a table. And they mean well, they had the grocery slip. Make sure she wasn't taking something extra. So, but we enjoyed it. We enjoyed the culture. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, everywhere we went, we involved ourselves with the culture. And unfortunately, a lot of Americans get stationed overseas. They don't do that. Right. And all they do is complain about being there. Right. Yeah. Uh, my brother was in Puerto Rico with yeah. the Coast Guard, and he, he, he got off the base and yeah. unbelievably, everyone just kind of stayed in a little sort of cave. Um, and then obviously you ended up back in Connecticut at some point. Came to Connecticut and uh, <coughs> I started at the base comm center. I worked for a lieutenant commander who uh, came in one day and said, Master Chief, I'm retiring. And I said, and who's taking your place? He says, well, you are, but it'll be just a short time. It'll be somebody in here, because it was an office of Miller. It'll be somebody in here in about two months' time, 18 months later. <laughs> so I had it all. I was the top secret control officer. We ran an armed forces courier station, the message center for all the boats, uh, crypto, the whole thing. Right. Yeah. And, um so yeah. we, we was you were you and your family living on the base? No, we okay. lived in, in Ledger. Yeah, we bought a home in Ledger, and uh, it was nice. It was really fine to get finally get to the end of my career is coming, but the settle in. Right. So your day was kind of commuting from Ledger into the base, Correct. and then mm -hmm. uh, ten mm -hmm. hours or eight or ten hours. Correct. And then yeah. we recall a blizzard of '78. Yeah. They secured everybody from the base around 1100. It took me an hour and a half to go from the base to my little house and. And legend, right. and I got stuck there for three days, and my people on watch had just communicated with them on the phone, telling them, "Okay, you're going to have to do the best," and, and so forth. And they did. Right. So, um, so you kind of made the full circle back to New England, uh, and uh, and then uh, it looks like it, by 1980 was when you decided it was time to do something different. And I retired. Yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, so it's 26 years altogether? 26 years, which, you know, it's like three years reserve time, but it was active reserve time, but it counted for pay, so yeah. I claimed 26. And what kind of work did you do after you left? When I left Millstone, believe it or not, I worked with Sonalist for three years. So I got hired and I was in the communication section. And my pre first project was SIAS, Single Integrated Antenna System for the Next Generation Boat, which I'm assuming is the Virginia class now. but. Uh, Somewhere along that contract uh, it was coming to its end and they got a contract with Northeast Utilities for emergency planning and they sent me over to Millstone and I spent a year over there working with Sonless but uh, for the utility uh, doing emergency planning procedures. And so and you ended up going to work for that? The utility offered me a job and, and basically I was a communicator so the job ended up managing all the telecommunications for the power plants, the station. All how, many years, units. how many years was that? I, I, I worked there 13 years with Northeast Utilities. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good. And I mean, there's a lot of ex Navy people who work at, at the plant, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Correct. So, uh, any of you knew from your prior days? Mm -hmm. Ironically, uh, I'd say I didn't know at the time, but I was going over to our Unit 3 plant and there was a man in front of me and he had a Navy Palm weather jacket on and on the back was stenciled CLG-5. Well, that's the Oklahoma City. Right. I caught up with him and I said, remember, there's 1,400 men on that Oklahoma City. So I said, what were you on there? It turned out he was on board at the same time I was, awesome. Bob Britton. So yeah. he was Griswold. But. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So you're wearing that medal around your neck, and uh, that's obviously because another chapter in your life after you left the Navy was that you got very active in veterans' uh, advocacy and issues, isn't that right? That's correct. I retired from Northeast Utilities in 1996, believe it or not, and I actually went back as a consultant for another year. But in 1998, I started volunteering at the Retired Activities Office on the base, and my goal was to help as many people that I can sending them in the right direction if they needed some help. And uh, it's worked quite well for me. I don't know how many people I've assisted, primarily the widows. And those are the important ones because so often we find in this RAO position, the widows aren't informed. I had one widow come in at age 85, her husband passed away, and she, I've never written a check. I've never written a check. So it's giving these people some assistance and helping them out the best we can. And where, where did you set up shop or where do they have you working? It's in Clayton it? Family Service Center, uh, building 83 on the submarine base. Okay, so you're right there back on the base. Back on the base. Yeah. And uh, we're having our annual seminar here in October, so we're gearing up for that now. Right. And you're also um, involved with a veteran service organization as well. Now it's... No. Correct, a uh, veterans advocacy group for maintaining the benefits and for promoting a strong defense. And I've been with them since, again since 1998. Right. And I serve as a regional vice president here for the Northeast. And it's a good group. They do a lot. Made up of all ranks, all services, and uh, fight the battle for us. Right. And you've yeah. been involved um, in Congressional Office and Veterans Advisory Councils, uh, Congressman Rob Simmons, my predecessor, and, and you know, you're working today. Correct, correct. Yeah. And it's a pleasure to be able to come to those meetings and uh, just because you know, Ryan will tell you there's many people out there, and I don't like to use the term dumb veterans. They don't understand the benefits that they can have. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, well, not many people get that. Uh, that medal that's around your neck. Uh, the Veterans Hall of Fame is a pretty elite group of uh, veterans in the state of Connecticut. And uh, what year? Did, did 2012. They? Yeah. Class of 2012. Which was one of the earliest classes, mm -hmm. too. I think it was third, second year out. Yeah. Yes. So that's uh, even more of an elite group there. Yeah. And, um, um, you know, we're lucky to have you in Connecticut. Obviously, uh, well, thank you're you. still serving the, the nation, really. And, yeah. you know, that started way back in 1955. Yeah, so. Well, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you want to no, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to, to come here today and thank uh, Connecticut Central State University. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have one other question for you. Now, you have a, a son who serves in the military, right? I have two sons. Maybe well, I have three sons. My yeah. oldest uh, is, lives in Griswold. He, he wanted to, but he changed his mind. But yeah. yes, I have two Marine sons. Uh, my son Jim retired a year ago in May. Uh, he was a colonel in the Marine Corps, served in Iraq. Uh, and my youngest is a colonel. He's serving now uh, for the third MEP, Camp Pendleton, California. Yeah, so the Dolan... 24 years he's got him. The Dolan contribution to our nation is multi-generational. Right. Yeah, so, well, good. Well, thank you, Paul, for taking the time. And we, thank you, know, you really honored that we helped sort of make you part of the Library of Congress's uh, archive. And thank you for inviting me. Yeah, great. All right. <laughs> thank you, sir. Yeah.